All right, so today is March the 7th. Um, my name is Anna Sparbury from the Museum of Chincoteague Island, and this is an um, interview for the Museum of Chincoteague Island and for the island, um, Chincoteague Island Library. And it's also for the Wood Museum of Wildfowl mm -hmm. Art yes. today. And Kristen Sullivan's here. She's a curator and folklorist at the Word Museum. And we are interviewing Ro Terry in his right. shop. What's the name of your shop? <laughs> Duck Van de Hoys. There you go. They've been calling me the Duck Man since the old CB days, Citizen Band Radio, <laughs> when everybody had a handle. And, uh, when the carvers here on the island died, they called him the Duck Man. And after he passed away, I took it. You took it? Nice. <laughs> Everybody has a nickname on this island, it seems. Pretty much. So when, when were you born? Born 5, 1953 in Whidbey Island, Washington, Washington State. When did you move to Shankatake? Well, the boys say I'm not a Shankatake because mm -hmm. I wasn't born here. But there isn't a whole hell of a lot of people that were born here. They were yeah. either born at the NASA base or they were born at NASA Waddocks or Salisbury, Maryland. So that makes them a local and me not. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, my dad was in aviation ordnance, uh, Navy. Oh. And uh, I was at a Naval Air Station in Woodby Island, Washington. So uh, as soon as I was born, dad got transferred to the, the Naval, Naval Air Station Shinkatag, mm -hmm. which is now the, the NASA base. I've been here all my life, but uh, I don't remember anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still not a local. I've only been here 61 years out of 61 years. Yeah. Well, they say Roy Jones isn't a low, isn't a shanky taker because he's born in acid There you go. Let's say that. <laughs> Old Jonesy. Yeah. Knowing well. So what was it like growing up? Well, it was fantastic. Uh, you know, even though I didn't have a dad to take me out and do stuff every day, I was uh, I lived in a very good section of shanky tigs. Lived down South Main Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, nobody had air conditioning or anything then. In the summertime, the, uh, my bed had a window right facing the Shinkatig Channel. And uh, the guy that pretty much raised me was Doug Jester Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, he did, his son didn't carve or go in the water or anything with him. I didn't have a dad to take me. So they tell me I was about four years old. And I, I walked in the back door one day and I had Doug by the hand. and. I said, this is Doug, can I keep him? <laughs> and uh, he was a neighbor, and uh, well, Doug was just a uh, young Doug, they call him, Uncle Doug. Uh, quite a bit younger. Uh, of course, then the old man, uh, who was born in the 1800s, his dad. And uh, Doug was a true waterman, hunter, fisherman, uh, waterman all of his life, and just loved kids to death. Uh, I think the gentleness of him was because he never looked a kid in the eye. You could little kids could walk up to him, and this big strong man would just always be laughing and talking and chopping out ducks with a hatchet, but he never made the eye contact with mm. the kids, so he didn't instill any fear to him. I really believe that, because any kid could come up and normally a big person, an adult, goes up and grabs them and hugs them and wants to scream at them, "Hey, I love you!" And the, yeah. the kids don't understand that, so Doug would just you know move around them and. They had that hatchet flying, and ducks flying, and kids would just line up and hmm. loved him to death. And he took me on the water and uh, clamming and fishing and hunting. And in the summertime, you could watch the, the down to bay boats. You were talking about old Roy Jones, old mm -hmm. Jonesy. I lived right down down the shore. I saw him all the time. On a Monday morning, it'd be a half a dozen of the 34, 35 foot gasoline scows, they called them, hmm. towing their little boats behind them, and they'd be heading heading from Matonka. Hmm. And they would tow these boats all the way down behind Akamak, and they would stay there from Monday to Friday, waving clams. And they would come back on Friday morning, and when I'd see Doug's boat coming by, I'd run down to, his, to the shore, to his house. He'd bring the boat on high tide up to the dock, mm -hmm. unload his clams, and he'd have a, a clam boxing 
a little cotton flannel mm-hmm. box thing underneath the bow of a boat. Uh, it'll be Friday. Full, we call them buttons. These little clams about yay big. Huh. Just as big as a button. He knew that's what I liked. Huh. He'd say, hey, here, bud. And he'd be about a hundred of them in a little moxin. And I'd go home and steam my little clams. <laughs> and nice. uh, he just thought that was great to be able to, he'd save them all week long. The little buttons that were too small to oh, even sell. That's sweet. And uh, he started making me decoys. He could break the limb off a tree in the backyard, take a hatchet, and chop a duck at her. I mean, hmm. no pattern, no nothing. Really? He was unbelievable. And I kept watching him, and I said, I want to do it. So uh, I was in my filing cabinet the other day right here. This is this is my filing cabinet. It's where every, every note and uh, every important thing I got gets stuck. There's a, this was a, this was young Doug right here. Thank you. On the, which one is he, on the left? Yep, that was Doug, Uncle Doug right there. Mm-hmm. And myself and my son, he made that boat. He made that skiff. That's real nice. Oh, that's great. We'll take and a picture. there was him, yeah. uh, I was about five or six years old. They got me a BB gun when I was, when I was six. That's and real I sweet. I killed my first duck at seven. Nice. It was a Brant, it was out of season. Mm-hmm. That was my first. <laughs> I guess that was my first downfall of the law. <laughs> uh, down on South Main Street at the time, all the brant, huge flocks of brant, uh, would come up by the edge of the road mm-hmm. all winter long. I mean, January, February, March, these hundreds and hundreds of brant would yeah. get by the road. And mom and dad gave me this gun. I was it was a daisy pump, and it was uh, too big for me to cock, so I'd get Doug to cock mm-hmm. it for me. I'd run across the street, and I'd shoot into these brant, and I'd run back, and he'd cock mm-hmm. it for me again. And I come running in, I was seven years old. I said, I killed me a duck. <laughs> he said, no, you didn't. I said, yeah, I did. I killed me a duck. Mom said, Doug, look out that window. And then there was this brant floating upside down. I shot into him, chucked him on the right side of the head. Killed him graveyard dead. Doug ran out, got him, cleaned him for me, and we ate him. Nice. And that was out of season. I had no license. <laughs> Shooting from the road over a highway. <laughs> I broke every law I could think of when I was seven years old. It's a good and, start. <laughs> and I thought, this is a good start. <laughs> and uh, I kept right on going. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get busted too bad too many times, but uh, I learned that uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to carve ducks. Mm-hmm. I wanted to eat them. I wanted to kill them, shoot them, carve them. And when I got 15 years old, I was watching Doug. And uh, he said, you can do it. Took his chopping block and hatchet, started chopping and carving, and I've got one of them in the house today. The first thing I ever made, 15 years old. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I kept right on making them through the Navy days, my four years in the Navy. And now, roughly 10,000 pieces later, uh, it's been a, it's been a good life, a real, real good life. Yep. Mm-hmm. Growing up on South Main Street, all the clams and fish you wanted, none of these motels, no McDonald's, which pretty much leads to Another little story, going over to see a cigar one day. A bunch of us stopped in after a, a pony roundup by boat. Old Captain Say would always be telling us stories. Mm-hmm. And this has been 15, 18 years ago. I said, you know, Captain, I said, this is, uh, this is, you, look, you lived the good old days, didn't you? And he threw that hatchet down that chopping block. He said, man, what are you talking about? He said, this is the good old days. He said, when I was being raised, he said, you're making two dollars a day. Yeah. He said, lucky if you had a car, no heat for your house, slept in four or five quilts. He said, look at you people now. He's got, mm-hmm. got a house, a summer house, boat, car, truck. <laughs> he said, man, you're living the good old days. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that was only about 15, 18 years ago. Huh. So, you know, there's people say, you know, the modernization of Shingatig and the bed and breakfasts and the Three-story motels is bad, but it brings us a good class of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't see the sunset go down as much as we used yeah. to for Main Street. But uh, Shingatay has still been a great place to be raised mm-hmm. and, and still a great place to live in. Going back a little bit, you talked about going clamming with Doug. How did you guys clam? Did you sign for clams or wait or what did you do? Man, I didn't know what I was getting into. All I knew was cutting grass uh, for, a, for a, a summertime job. Sucked. <laughs> and I still won't cut grass. I hated cutting grass. And my buddy, Jimmy, who you just met, Jimmy Whitton, he's, uh, 
we're like brothers. So I'm, I'm Brother Roe and he's Brother Jim whenever we talk. Uh, he was with Doug first and uh, he came in one week. I said, how'd you do? He said, well, I went down to Bay with Doug for a week and I came home with 300 some dollars. He said, I looked at Doug I said, Dougie, what am I going to do with all this money? Doug says, here. And he took $200. He said, no, the rest is yours. He said, but this, you won't start you a bank account. Nice. And Doug took him to the bank and started him a bank account. And when I found out how much he made, I thought, man, you know, it can't be that hard to go clamming. <laughs> so I told Doug I want to go down with him. He said, okay, he got you a boat. I went and got me a little scow, a 13-foot Wink Watson <laughs> scow with a, a 35-horse Ever King. It was half Evermood and half Sea King. You all don't even know what that means. Nope. Clarence Clark had built this uh, engine out of two engines. He was a local mercury dealer here on the island. So he put this this motor together and uh, the boat was a 13-foot scow. You, you would tow them behind the big boat all mm -hmm. the way down the bay. You got down there Monday about noon and you clammed as long as the tide would permit you to. Mm -hmm. Now when the tide was, was falling, first started falling, you jumped overboard about chest deep. Mm -hmm. With these cotton flannel moccasins, you held onto your boat and you waited them. You caught them with your feet, put them up your leg, threw them in the yep. boat, one after the other. You just kept wading backwards, sliding your feet. Now, when it got too deep, too shallow for you to wade because you didn't want to break your back by bending over, mm -hmm. when it got too shallow, then you anchored your boat, you had your clam basket and your gaff hook, your little two prong hook, mm -hmm. and you waded ashore where the, the mud was dry and you signed them. Mm -hmm. And you signed them, you dumped them out and made piles and you signed them. When the car started covering the flat, you waded offshore, got your boat, waded it in, piled your clams in the boat, went back over, and you started wading again until it was too deep mm -hmm. to wade them. So you covered two and a half tides. Wow. It was about 16 hours a day. That's a long day. Yeah, and that's why I thought this clamming was going to be an easy job. <laughs> so we got in the boat, and the first night, I'll never forget, I sat down and we were in the cabin. The cabin was about eight feet wide. It was long enough for two people to sleep. Doug had a fold down bed. And I said, what are we eating for dinner? Well, Doug had a little two burner gas, propane gas uh, stove and one frying pan. And he put that pan up and he reached underneath the stern. We had no refrigeration. Had a cardboard box under the stern, mm -hmm. July. Mm -hmm. He'd had this rag baloney. It was a baloney covered in a, 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 a canvas jacket. We called it rag baloney. <laughs> He'd cut you off a slab about that thick, throw it in the frying pan. My buddy Jimmy, brother Jim, said, uh, said we're having down the bay strawberries to go with it. Mm. I said, damn, that's what I said. Mm. Mm. Down the bay strawberries, that's got to be good. It's called baked beans. Oh. <laughs> when, the, when the meat got warm, he'd take those baked beans and crank them open, had the rust all over the can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they worry about dates now. Good God. <laughs> Throw them baked beans on top of that bologna, stir it up, got them hot, put them on your plate, and that was it. Give you a piece of, uh, give you a piece of bread mm -hmm. and some, uh, some black molasses. That line on the jar, mm -hmm. old thick black molasses. Mm -hmm. God, give you indigestion like you won't believe. <laughs> and that was it. Piece of bread, some black molasses, and uh, beans and, and, and bologna. Mm -hmm. That was the main meal he cooked. You went to sleep. And Doug had his clock set. He knew when the low tide was going to be. And it might be 2 in the morning, because tides were every 6 yeah. hours. So it might be 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. That old Big Ben clock would go off. And uh, Jimmy would tap on the bunk. He said, you think he heard it? I said, God damn, I hope not, son. I hope not. <laughs> and we lay there about 5 minutes. And pretty soon, you see that match go off. Mm -hmm. Doug smoked like you wouldn't believe. He'd be laying there in the bunk. The first thing he had to do was have him a cigarette. So when that match went off, you knew you had to go to work. Yeah. So you got up two, three o'clock in the morning. He said, get your clothes, boys. You went on top of the cabin. The clothes you had been waiting in the day before that were soaking wet, you laid them on top of the cabin to start drying. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Two o'clock in the morning, they weren't dry. Not dry. You were putting on cold, wet clothes to give you an apple, a uh, piece of bread, Pepsi Cola, pack of cigarettes. That was it. Eesh. That was it. If you if you want to make a ham sandwich out of that rag baloney, that's up to you. Huh. Doug wasn't your babysitter. <laughs> he wasn't your mom or your daddy. Jumped in the boat and we started going off to the flats and we started jumping overboard and waiting. Hmm. Three o'clock in the morning. 
pitch yeah. black. These old big sea turtles coming up, sharks everywhere, bullfish, stingrays. So we did this summer after summer. And uh, I was talking to Jim about it the other day. One morning the sun come up and I was sitting on the bow of the boat. My, my boat. And I could hear Jimmy throwing his clams in one after the other. He said, what are you doing? I said, Jim, I'm eliminating jobs. He says, what? I said, I'm eliminating jobs. I'm done. I ain't going to be a clamor the rest of my mm -hmm. life. I said, this ain't what it could out to be. The watermen, you're up against the elements, yeah. you're up against the weather, I mean, the tides, the wind, you're fighting it all the time. Yeah. And I knew right then, I put this in the old bank here, I, I thought, I ain't going to be a clamor all my life. Yeah. It's got to be a better job. It's hard life. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was one of the last times I went down. Wow. Do you ever, ever sign or uh, wade clams for fun now? Sign them all the time. Got a wife, she's the best clam signer in the world. Loves it to death. Nice. Um, wading them, no. I know what's under that bottom now. Mm -hmm. I know all these creatures floating around and flipping <laughs> around. Uh, I've, been, I've been hunting sharks all my life, me and Jimmy. When Jaws came out and we saw the movie, when they when harpooned them, uh -huh. God, we've been doing that for years. <laughs> I mean, these. The big sharks would come up in these bays, two foot of water, mm -hmm. to spawn, to have their young ones. Well, we didn't know they were having young ones. We just wanted to kill them. Six, seven, eight foot long. Yeah. And we killed the hell out of them. I mean, we killed a lot of sharks. And that was the same waters we were wading clams in. Mm. So nowadays, oh, hell, I'd go down to one of these stores and buy me 20 clams. It's a lot easier than <laughs> catching them, wading them. <laughs> now, it'd be, it'd be fun to do it again if I knew a good place that, uh, that I wasn't going to get cut on and and yeah. stung and bit and eaten up and mm -hmm. uh, just had enough of it. Yeah, understandable. So Doug Jester Jr. that um, the, that you said was yours. <laughs> um, and that's he's the son of Doug Jester Sr., the old time carver yep. here, right? Yep. Okay. Did you ever know him? No, I didn't know the old man. He died in 60, 61. Okay. And I would have been about eight years old then. Mm -hmm. I probably met him with with Doug in the mm -hmm. younger days. But just don't don't we call it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I didn't want to be messing around with the other guys. I wanted to have Doug. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, but you knew Mr. Miles, right? Yeah. Yeah, I got, yeah. Yep. What was that like to to go? Did you watch him carve, or what did you do? Yeah. By then, um, uh, right after the flood of '62, we moved up to uh, Ocean Boulevard, mm -hmm. which was put me a whole lot closer. I mean, mm -hmm. you were walking back in those days, mm -hmm. bicycle or walking, yep. so it puts you halfway across town. And uh, I went up to uh, Mr. Miles' uh, Terrapin farm mm -hmm. and where he carved and would go there day after day after day. Uh, I wasn't, at that time, I was probably, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, in that age, uh, up to about 14. And uh, of course, he died in 74. Uh, I, I don't think I really wanted to be a carver then as much as a hunter, mm -hmm. fisherman, and raise, raise Terrapins. I kept mm -hmm. asking him, you know, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. He had a like a barn that went out into the water, mm -hmm. and it was uh, an impoundment, like a building. And, and the sand came, ebbed, ebbed and, uh, the sand would ebb out on low tide. He could go in that door and, and close the door. I don't know if it was a vibration or what the turtles felt, but he'd have four or five hundred turtles in this barn that went overboard, but fenced in. Mm -hmm. And here they come like D-Day, come crawling out of the sand. <laughs> And he'd be throwing some kind of pellets or food or something out to him. I don't know what he fed them with, but it was just when they they could feel him walking or the door, the vibration, whatever it was. And here comes all these terrapins out, and he was he was potting most of them out in in, uh, in Oyster Bay, in Little Bay, and he was telling me how the pot would have to, of course, be uh, the bay couldn't be so deep that the the pot would go underwater because mm -hmm. I thought turtles could swim underwater, could live there all their lives. But they got to breathe. Yeah. So they got to be able. When you pot them, they got to be able to poke their heads up and get fresh air. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me all where he goes and the nets he used and the pots and mm -hmm. uh, watch him carve and uh, nicest gentleman. Again, he didn't. They hardly ever looked at you. He'd be working and chewing and uh, his wife come out one day. And he was chewing that backy. Mm -hmm. And boy, she didn't like it at all. <laughs> she came out and gave him hell for chewing at the backy and he wiped his beard and lip. And she took off his backy and yelled at him and in the house she went. He laughed at me, he didn't get mad a bit. Stood up, <laughs> reached up over the, over the door sill, reached out and had him a, four or five cigars. 
And he took this cigar and that plastic, bit it in half. He said, she don't know about these. And he put it back. He was chewing cigars. I mean, he didn't have to have any quality back. He chewed it, he chewed it, and he spit in that can, and just like you saw on the old Western days, mm -hmm. ping, he ran that can every time. God, he was just he was something else. He was selling me his miniatures, these little miniatures, mm -hmm. kept them in the house. In the summertime, he had a towel over top the wool stove, and he'd have them on there, and they were $3 a piece. Mm. And I was buying them. I was a decoy broker at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I was buying them, but I was buying these little miniatures for $3 a piece. And I bought them and bought them, and I went there one day. I said, uh, this was after he had his leg cut off. He had to have his leg uh, amputated, I think diabetes. Oh, there was. So he's sitting there on the couch, and uh, I said, Mr. Miles, I want to get some more miniatures. He said, well, there they are, son. Pick out what you want. He said, but I had to go up. He said, they're five dollars now. Mm. I said, good Lord, five dollars? I said, I'll take one, but I can't afford no more. <laughs> and that was the last miniature I bought from him mm. for five dollars. Mm. He was selling me, he was selling me life-size decoys to hunt with for three dollars a piece. Wow. Um, at the time, I was 15, and I told mom I wanted a, a dozen dippers and a dozen shell ducks mm -hmm. to gun with from Mr. Miles. But she said, how much are they? I said, they're $3 a piece. They're $36 a dozen. She said, well, if you want them, that's all you're going to get. You ain't getting nothing else. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of money. So she got them for me, and I got a picture, I'll show you in a little bit, of me opening them up under the Christmas tree. Aww. And she got me a dozen dippers, a dozen shell ducks, and I thought, just like right now, if you go to an auction, and somebody consigns a Miles Hancock. Mm -hmm. It might have, it might be a Mason decoy body. Mm -hmm. It might be a, a Doug Jester body. Miles would tell us, he said, you boys can't afford these high-priced ducks. He said, so he would put his head on anybody's body. Mm -hmm. And back then, we gunned with all wooden birds. Yeah. You broke the heads off all the time. Threw them in the corner. Mm -hmm. Next summer, you make a bunch of heads and, and rehead them. So Miles wasn't selling people fake birds. Right. In his mind, he made the body, he made the head, he painted them, mm -hmm. or he fitted the head on. But the body could be Sears and Robot, it could yep. be a, a Pratt or a Mason or anybody in the world. It could be Upper Bay body. Yeah. And and this picture I've got, when I thought were all original Miles Hancocks, half of them were machine-made bodies. <laughs> Masons and so on. <laughs> and he put his head on it, and it could have been a bluebill, a black duck, anything. <laughs> If you wanted dippers, they were going to be black or white. <laughs> he painted them as a different. Yeah, they were some of that big and some of that big. But they were different. And then you wanted shell ducks, he put a shell duck head. It could have been a canvas back, but now it's a shell duck. That's good. And he painted it like a shell duck. Well, ducks probably didn't care. So, no, they didn't. And we killed all kinds of birds over them, but uh, I kept them for years and years and years and don't have any of them right now. Oh. Uh, there was an auction at Zeb Barfields last week, and a boy bought a buffalo head. I'm a factory made buffalo head with a Miles paint job mm -hmm. and, a, and it looks just like one of my used to have. Really? And he's going to he's gonna sell it to me. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll we'll we'll get, get it back. back from him. But he was a uh, super guy. Super guy. That's neat. Yeah. Um, do you remember, have any memories of going to school on Chincoteague and what, all that, life. what that was like or trouble <laughs> you got into? <laughs> it was a good old days. That was a good old days. We were, we were building guns in school <laughs> and shot pass. Our shop teacher taught us how to build a crossbow. We could build a crossbow and shoot a thousand yards. <laughs> I mean, Bill Christman, best shop teacher in the world. I've got a handmade longbow. He built wow. a press. Wow. We were making bows and arrows and shot. We never killed nobody. We went to, we went hunting before school. We went hunting after school. We had our guns in our cars, mm -hmm. shotguns, rifles, had rats right in the back. Mm. Nobody cared. Now you got to teach these little wussies. You can't, you can't do that in, in school. Oh my God, you're going to grow up to be a Democrat. My God, watch out. God forbid. So, yeah, God forbid. So, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, memories of school. We had smoking grounds up behind the school. Mm -hmm. Smoke break. All the kids went back, had a mm -hmm. cigarette, got unwound, and came back and did class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I grew up, become an electronic technician. No, smoking now, can't do that. My God, you'd be a moron. Don't have a gun, don't have a, a knife, uh, don't fight nobody. Mm -hmm. I was probably the first kid, me and my buddy Harry, uh, Harry Birch, to ever get an E in personal conduct in the first grade. First grade, teacher come in, we were fist fighting under the, under the desk. <laughs> I swear to God, called her, called her parents, had to go there, and parents met with uh, the teacher. 
First grade, I got an E in personal conduct. That's mm -hmm. closer to it. That's close to F as you can get. Mm -hmm. I almost <laughs> failed personal conduct in the first grade. <laughs> we were fist fighting in the floor over something. We were friends, friends now. <laughs> best, uh, I mean, he's as almost as close as yeah. his brother Jim. Yep. But they were the good old days. Now they want to suspend you. Want thirty out for fighting. Mm -hmm. For kissing a girl, <laughs> kiss a guy now, they won't say nothing about it. No, they won't kiss no girls. They throw you out. Mm. So different times. So that after you graduated, you did you go into the navy after that? Yep, you were, I wanted to go in the navy. I did not want to be home. Mm. Where'd you go in the navy? How? Or, I wait, got, where'd you go to sign I went clean home? across the big water. I went clean across Chesapeake Bay, <laughs> all the way across Norfolk. Big water. All the way in Norfolk. Yep, yep. yep. But I said, where'd you go? I said, I went across the big water. I'd only been to Norfolk two or three times, so that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I became, uh, the last thing I hated, I hated uh, math, I hated science in school. I always failed, I always took doubled up. I wanted to be the smartest math person and the science person in the world. Mm -hmm. So I failed Algebra 1 and took it again next year along mm -hmm. with Algebra 2. And I failed Geometry, so I took that the next year along with Algebra 2. And then geometry, of course, I just kept taking never one double because I failed them year before. <laughs> science, general science, biology, I always failed in one year and doubled up next year. Mm. I go in the Navy, took the aptitude test, I scored above average in math and above average in science. Mm. I didn't want to do that. They made a radium out of me. I didn't want that. I wanted to be uh, on, a, on a gunboat or doing something with weapons, and they made a radium. Mm. So then they sent me to school. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to school. So I had to. Mm -hmm. So I became a radioman. I got stuck at, at a place called Com Sublamp. We, we monitored the submarine broadcast of the whole U.S. Atlantic right. Fleet in Norfolk, Virginia. It was called neutral duty at the time, so it wasn't sea duty. It wasn't it wasn't shore duty. Mm -hmm. So when my two years was up, I was married. I had a youngin, and uh, they said now you can go on a on, on a med cruise on a destroyer or something and be a, be away for for next year and a half, mm -hmm. or you can just finish out right here. Well, I never knew my dad. He was 23 years Navy. Got Lou Gehrig disease before he retired, and I read at retirement, and uh, he got it when I was six and died when I was nine. Mm. So I never knew him because of the U.S. Navy. Yeah. He was always gone. So I said, here, I got me a little son, and I'm gonna leave him for a year and a half. Ain't gonna happen. Yeah. So when my four years was up, I got out with no job. I was supposed to start as a guide at a hunting lodge at the Pope's Island Hunt Club. Mm -hmm. And I was going to start on Monday, and I had put in for a job at NOAA for about six months before that. Mm -hmm. And they called me on a Friday at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. at night. A man had just retired. They didn't want to pay transfer or traveling fees and all that. And they said, uh, you still want that job as an as a electronic technician, mm -hmm. tracking satellites? I said, yeah. I said, when? They said, Monday. <laughs> of course. Now, that was, that was pretty good. So I went under my, the guy was going to hire me, and old Bill Savage, and uh, he said, son, he said, I ain't, my feelings ain't hurt a bit. He said, take the government job. Mm -hmm. And I lasted yeah. five years. Couldn't do that. <laughs> and I ended up going back and retiring from it. Uh, now things turned out perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you are retired now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I retired uh, September of 13. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to, how did you meet Monty? Did you meet her in school, your wife? High school, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, she was the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life. I went to when I went to boot camp. She said she'll wait for me. And I thought we both thought we might get married someday, but being away from somebody, they talk about that absence mm -hmm. makes the heart go fonder or stronger mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. I called her from boot camp. I said let's get married. So on my boot camp leave, uh, I've been gone nine weeks, and uh, December twenty, I got home. Got home December twenty third, and got married December twenty fourth. Wow. And that's been about 50 years ago. Um, when it says how long you've been married, you say all my life. Pretty much <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so you quit your government job for a while, though. To carve? Nine, to nine carve. and a half years. Yeah. yeah so let me talk about that again. Because I know you talked about it before we had the camera. Yeah. Camera stuff. Back on uh, the, the, the kids nowadays that want to be carvers, I mean, I knew I was artistic. Uh, I, I wanted to be a cigar daisy. I used mm. to go over to cigs all the time. And my buddy would take me over, he'd have bushel baskets of heads and bushel baskets of bodies. And I'd look at him and I thought, you know, he can put them in the water, a duck flies by, think it's a real thing, comes out to it, and you kill him. And, and I wanted, I liked hunting, mm -hmm. and I knew that I could make a decoy. 
And uh, I made this bird, and it was the best thing I thought I'd ever made. Of course, it was only only made about six of them. I was 15, and I took it to Captain Sig, and I said, uh, I said, what do you think of it? He says, well, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. He gave it back to me. I was 15 years old. I said, do what? He said, well, you're trying to make a nice bird, a nice detailed bird. I said, yes, sir. He said, what would you use for wood? I said, cottonwood. Yeah. He said, you can't do that. He said, you got to have better wood. Mm -hmm. So the sow's ear was the cottonwood. Mm -hmm. Now, I was trying to make a silk purse out of it. You can't do it. you got to have better wood. Now, you know what Sig was using? Cottonwood. That's all he was using. <laughs> but he knew some things about it that I did. Yeah. About being green, about being dry, about hollowing it out, sealing it. Uh, there was a lot of things that I didn't... Sig would always say, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Well, you had to ask the question. If you didn't yeah. know how to ask the question, then, you know, the old saying is, I taught him everything he knows, mm -hmm. but I didn't teach him everything I know. Mm -hmm. So he's only telling you, what you asked him. Yeah. And then he'd kind of laugh and you come back and he'd say, why'd you do that? He said, oh, I said, well, I, th I thought you said, he said, no, 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 I didn't say that. You <laughs> said, can I do this? I said, sure, you can do it. You went home and did it. It was wrong. <laughs> well, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you do it to me again. So he, he, but he, he could have been the best carver. I mean, he won best in the world for mm -hmm. working decoy. But he could have been better than anybody. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will doubt and they'll, they'll say they'll, they'll differ with me. They got to remember, Sig was doing it for a living. Lucy, his wife, she didn't work. He was trying to raise a household. I mean, I know what he, what he went through because I did this for 10 years. My wife didn't work. I had two kids, house payment, electric bills. Mm -hmm. I maintained my health insurance. I did everything. I paid everything. I didn't go up to D.C. and say, I'm entitled to some free money. Mm -hmm. Because I made a stupid move. I mm -hmm. became a carver. You can get out of you get anything out of this world you want. Just put forth a little bit of effort. So Sig had to put forth the effort. Yeah. He carved, he fished nets, he fished duck traps, he did anything he could for a dollar. So he didn't have time to make a really good bird. Yeah. He made a nice bird. And he made a lot of money at it. And he always he never did when I say I didn't learn from Sig, I learned so much that that's why I've been successful doing this. Mm. Um, he never showed me carve here, carve there, paint here, paint there. I wanted to do my own style. Yeah. Sig uh, would always tell me. Uh, I'd go to shows, he'd sit behind the table with me, I'd say, Sig, what do you think about that? He'd say, yeah, looks like shit, but it looks like you. I said, do what? <laughs> he said, it looks just like you. He said, I can tell your bird from a mile away. Mm. He said, but that's good because they look like your style. Mm -hmm. He said, now, the shit part, <laughs> if you want to edit that out or whatever, the bad part about the bird, <laughs> the white is too white. He said, you need mm -hmm. to tone it down with some brown. You need to make the bill a little bit shorter, the head a little bit. That was, he said, but these birds, your style, they look like Rotary's birds. Yes. And that's what I've always strived for. I didn't yeah. copy off nobody. I wanted my birds to like, look like my birds. Sigs had his own patterns. He drew them all. And they looked like his bird. They looked like real ducks. Mm -hmm. and he could have made them look like they were flying, but he didn't have time. And he'd say, boy, you yeah. can make a living out of this. He said, but you got a hundred dollar unto death. He said, anybody. He said, listen to these women. Watch these women on TV. And the husband says, or the boyfriend says, how much did that dress cost? He said, oh, it was only $99.99. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You didn't spend a hundred dollars. Yeah. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, we're near a hundred. It was only $99. Yeah. He said, do the same thing with your ducks. He said, you break that $100 mark, and your clientele is going to go down. Mm. You break the 200 Have your birds 190 Have them 95 yeah. Don't break the 100 mm. Well, don't come in here now. And and I know a lot of the shore birds I'm doing should be $125, $140 birds. Now I'll sell two a week. Mm. But I can put 95 on them. I've made these. I've made those since Monday. Wow. I can make 40 50 birds a week. Uh, now I can't paint them all that quick, yeah. but in two weeks I'll do 50 birds or so. I'm doing, yeah. highest I ever did was uh, just over 800 pieces in one year. Wow. And the only reason I did 800 is because I was trying to catch Sig. Hmm. And Sig still swears that he made 1,100 pieces one year. Wow. 1,100. <laughs> Let me tell you something, I tried to catch him. <laughs> and it's impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> So, yeah. anyway, back on these young boys, the, uh, the, new, the new breed of carvers we mm -hmm. got. 
I've tried to tell, I'll help them any way they can, any way I can. I'll tell them anything. Give them a wood, nod, anything. But they know they can't make a living at it no more. Yeah. It's impossible. You can't start in 2015 and become a, I'm saying you can't make a living carving. Uh, there's people that, that can say, oh, well, I'm, I just started uh, carving a few years ago. And I'm making a living at it. I said, well, how old are you? Uh, 58. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you retired from anything? Oh, yeah, I'm an executive from General Electric. Yeah. Or, and I took 17 classes with Pat Godden and all mm -hmm. these big guys, you know. <laughs> oh, so you're making a living. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, tell me about it. Yeah, this guy come in from, from Louisiana or Alabama a couple years ago, him and two of his buddies. And he'd been guiding, they'd been hunting, uh, down here hunting ducks with uh, Grayson Chester. And the guy started bragging. He said, uh, I make ducks too. He said, I do it for a living. I said, do you now? Yeah. He said, I get a thousand dollars a piece for my decoys. I said, you're pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I am. I said, you do, a do it for a living. Yeah. I said, how many ducks do you do a year? Oh, about 13, 14. <laughs> I said, do you now? Yeah. A thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> So wait a minute, I'm gonna get my math and I said, you make about thirteen thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. You do it for a living. I said, I'll bet you're married, aren't you? Yeah. I said, what your wife did? Oh, she's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no shit. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you carved up for a living. <laughs> for a living. Well his two buddies were backing up farther and farther. <laughs> they were they were like turning their heads and all that, <laughs> laughing. I said I gave it to him up one side and down the other. They didn't need us to say he never been back. Really? Yeah. Yep, never come back. Thousand dollars a piece. I'm getting a couple hundred, and he does about thirteen dollars mm -hmm. a year. Oh, I blow more sawdust out of my nose than he carves in a year. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me about making ducks or making money. It's hard to do. Uh, there's too much competition. Yeah. You guys are affiliated with the Ward Show. Go to the Ward Foundation. Go go to any show in the world now. There's there used to be three or four shows a year. Mm -hmm. the, the Virginia Beach had the big Back Bay Wildfowlers Guild. Louisiana had one, Salisbury, mm -hmm. the Ward Foundation, uh, that's been everywhere, Ocean City, and there, there, was, there was a few shows. Now there's one, there's yeah, ten well, shows a month, a week, everywhere. Everybody's got a show. Yeah. When you go to a show, and these tables are lined up end to end to end, and I got a, I got a buffalo head for twenty dollars, and you're next to me, and you got one for eighteen, mm -hmm. and your next table, you got one for fifteen, well let me tell you something, between fifteen and twenty is five whole dollars. They're going to buy the 15 one yeah. most of the time. It's competition, and everybody is doing it. Yep. So it's not like the old days. I was lucky. I got started at the right time. The late 60s, early 70s is when it started. That's when it really just took off. Mm -hmm. uh, I was buying Irons and Deacon Wood for $8 a piece wow. in the 70s. Man came up on Sickle Bill Lewis. Stopped me one day. I was in school. Me and wife we were riding around before school started, and uh, old Bill pulled me over. He said, Boy, I heard you're buying decoys. I said, well, Mr. Bill, when I can. He said, well, I got one here you might want. He reached in the back of the truck and had an Ira Hudson pintail. Hmm. I said, what do you want for? He said, ten dollars. I said, ten dollars? Are you crazy? I said, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, how much you got? And I reached in my pocket, I had eight dollars. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll take it. Nice. And I bought my first old decoy for eight dollars, the Ira Hudson pintail. You still have it or did you sell it? I sold that about 10 years later, maybe 10. I sold that for a $100 bill. Nice. And I said, you know what? There's money in being a, <laughs> money in being a, de a dealer. And mm -hmm. Sigal would told me too. He said, boy, he said, buy a duck for 10 and sell it for 20. Mm -hmm. It beats the heck out of doing this all day long. Mm -hmm. Band-aids all over your thumbs and mm -hmm. shoulders. Hey, this shoulder done uh, two years ago, rotator cuff surgery. Surgery went up to, I was up to, uh, Six months after I had it done, no, let's see, March, April, the month after I got out of my sling, I was in a sling for six weeks, and I was at St. Michael's, and a surgeon found out he was a surgeon, come through the, the tables, and uh, he wanted to know about me and about my carving, and I told him I wasn't carving now because I was recuperating from rotator cuff surgery. He said, you'll never carve again. Mm. He said, you chop ducks out with a hatchet? Yes, sir. He said, you'll never chop again. He said, that's called blunt force trauma, every time yep. that hatchet hits. And I do every one of my ducks right now. I'm taking that thing and I'm chopping every duck. Yeah. Bam, 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 there's baskets up. Uh, and every time you hit it, he said he called blunt force trauma. 
six months after I got my operation, I was down in Louisiana pulling in alligators. And by Christmas, I was making 10, 15, 20 ducks a week. And this is how I, I bandsaw them out. Get a rough shape on them. And I sit here, and that's how I take the wood off all day long. Duck after duck after duck. And yep. after a while, the old shoulder gets torn up. I mean, even holding this and trying to squeeze and the cottonwood logs, splitting them. Uh, I just, me and my buddy put away 500 blocks last right. summer. I'm getting, I figure I've still got a couple thousand birds on me. What kind of wood do you use? Cottonwood? This is white cedar out of New Jersey and the rest of it's cottonwood. I use cottonwood and white cedar. Doesn't really matter. The white cedar I buy, it's green when I buy it, air dried. So I never know if, if it's completely ready to go. Mm. So I put it away for like five years. And in the meantime, the cottonwood will dry in about two years. Mm -hmm. So I rotate them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those mergansers, those bodies are cottonwood. Uh, the, the ruddy mm -hmm. ducks underneath them, the little ducks, they're cottonwood. And the bluebills are cedar. And the egrets are cedar. It, it doesn't matter either one. I like, I like them both. So if I recall correctly, you helped to start the Carvers and Artists Association. Is that right? <laughs> Do I want to be asking you about that? <laughs> me, and, uh, me and Reggie Burt started okay. that together. It was uh, pretty much our brainstorm and mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't uh, pan out the way I thought it was going to pan out. Uh, no. What were you hoping for when you started it? Or why did you start I it? I wanted to start it. My, my idea, me and Reggie sat down and, uh, and we started this contest and we were going to have awards like for a head whittling contest. Mm -hmm and a body making, con a working decoy contest, and we were going to call them the, the Doug Jester Award, and the mm -hmm. Miles Hancock Award, and the Ira Hudson Award. I said we can have dues, and we can take the dues money and buy truckloads of wood, and let all the carvers who are members divvy it up. Mm -hmm. Because you buy, you buy bulk. Yeah. Instead of paying four dollars a foot, we might get it for a dollar and a half a foot. Mm -hmm. I said we can do that. We can buy paint and knives and help the decoy. We thought it was a carvers association. Now it's a carvers and artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the all the young, I mean, all, it was all shangitakers pretty much. Yeah. And all the carvers, and we had a good a good group of them. We've lost a lot of them, uh, died off, but uh, we had a, we had a good group of carvers on here, yeah. and I kind of think that's why they joined it originally. And then it turned out to be a little more political and uh, money. Money's good, but it's bad too. Did you go to any of the um, carving shows or competitions before the the Shinkti Carver Association ones, like the Snow Goose um, good God, competition? Man. Was that before your time? No, I've got my first ribbon. Was, I've won over 300 ribbons. And my first one was dated, I'm pretty sure it was dated 1971. So that goes back a right good ways. That mm -hmm. was here at the... Uh, at the Greater Snow Goose Show. Mm -hmm. What'd you win it for? Buffalo Head. The yeah. one that Sig said you can't make a silk first apple <laughs> sour. <there. laughs> nice. Yeah. But of course, see, it was an honorable mention. And of course, going to school back in those days, the art teacher would give you first, second, third, and everybody else got an honorable mention. Or a bunch of them. They wanted to keep you interested, keep mm -hmm. you coming back. Mm -hmm. So I either got 15th or 16th place and didn't know it. I thought I got fourth place. <laughs> it was probably either 15th or 16th. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, the next year I went back and I won a third. Hmm. Then I went I won a second, then a first. Then I started winning best in divisions, best in shows. I flew to California, was a judge out there. Yeah. I judged all over the place. Judge with cigar many times. Mm -hmm. So I won over 300, over 100 blue ribbons. And uh, now I tell them I don't collect silk ribbons, I collect dollar bills. <laughs> They go a lot farther. Yep. But you gotta collect the ribbons before you collect the money. Yep. You gotta pay your dues. What kind of decoys do you use to hunt with? I used to hunt with the plastic stuff. Yeah, I still hunt with some plastic decoys now. They're more durable in the conditions we have now when the bay freezes up and making ice all over your decoy, mm -hmm. you can sail up and take your shoving pole a pole and, and smack them and bust the ice off them. Yeah. Uh, my decoys are running two to four hundred dollars a piece now, my working decoys. And uh, I ain't gonna smack those with no, no. no shoving pole. <laughs> they just won't stand it. But I like I like using my own working decoys. Do you still hunt hunt over them of your own? I got 170 right there. We'll get a picture of those sometime, and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that's the ones I hunt over. 
Uh, I love shooting over the real thing. I like how the, to, to watch the reaction of the birds when mm -hmm. they land. I usually don't make rigs of decoy woods for people. They're quite expensive. But I've got a good following that will come in and buy a pair every year, maybe twice a year. You know, get them in after five or six years. they got a nice rig of handmade mm -hmm. hollow working decoys. And they help with them a couple times and put them away. Mm. They're speculating. What's your favorite thing to carve these days? What kind of birds? Probably the hooded merganser. Hmm. Uh, the hairhead we call them. Yep. Uh, I love making them. Uh, I'm fascinated by them. I've got a place where I shoot a lot of them. And I can put them out in the pond and, and watch them land and see how they reaction. And they, there's, they can put their head in a hundred different positions. Mm -hmm. God, it's unbelievable what it can do with that little bit of crest. Yeah. The hands and the drakes. So I've got 14 of them over there. I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to make one of every head style. They're on that right hand side with that filing cabinet. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And they're really, they're, really, they're really fun to shoot and hunt, and, and they're pretty little bird. And they sell great. You get into some decorative painting. Do you ever do any really decorative carving? Or I did. Uh, yeah. See, when I started off, again, I thought I thought you had to make this Ward Foundation stuff. Uh -huh. I'd go up there to the show, and my God, seeing the life, the life-size swans and turkeys and everything with inserted feathers, I thought that's where the money was. But I figured out my time is money. Mm -hmm. Your time is money. I mean, you can't go to work all day long and not get paid for it. Yeah. And the decorative stuff, you're doing a you're doing a bird every month, every month and a half with, yeah. with primaries inserted, basswood veneer and all that stuff. Uh, using your burning tools to burn every little feather. Mm -hmm. Somebody gives you a thousand bucks for it. Yeah. Again, back to that other guy that was making them, you know, a thousand dollars a duck and making twelve a year. Mm -hmm. I'd rather make two hundred. And, and get a couple hundred a piece. It's it just, it's just a, my clientele. It's, you, you're separating your, the rich folks from the poor folks. The average person comes in, they'll spend a couple hundred dollars. Hmm. So I don't. I did. I've done all kinds of wood ducks and teal and everything with every feather burned under them. But don't hmm. do them anymore. What kind of paint do you use under the um, voice? Painting now, I do. Uh, I use all acrylics. 99% uh, acrylic. I will paint some oil painted birds in the summertime. Uh, I've got the, the propane heater here. I don't like using all the dryers and the oil paints in the wintertime mm -hmm. in here where it's closed yeah. in. Uh, there's too much chance for fire and for the fumes of it. Yeah. So if I'm going to paint with oils, I save the birds up and I'll paint a, a big oil birds. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing about 20 buffalo heads right now. I'm making them and they're all going to be painted in the, in the oil paints. But by the time I get them done, well, it might warm up this summer. I'm not even sure if, we're, if it's going to warm up by July. <laughs> After the winter we've had, I mean, I'm not too, I'm not too thrilled about it. Do you, have you worked with dogs? Do you use dogs in your hunting? No. I've always had, uh, we had labs for like 20, 26 years. Uh, three of them that overlapped each other. Mm -hmm. I, I was a hunting guide for 10 years and the people would come and bring their dogs and it'd be 18 degrees and the water chill was probably down to 12 mm -hmm. and and the dogs were jumping in the water and coming back and shivering and shaking yeah. and making ice and the guy would go, I said, isn't that cold on it? Oh, no, no, they like it, they like it. And that lab sitting there just oh. shaking like that. And I thought, you know what, I ought to throw your ass overboard mm -hmm. and see if you like it. <laughs> and, and the oyster shells for labs here, we got a lot of yeah. oyster rocks and cutting their pads. They're jumping all through the decoy trying to get a little place to get out of the wind. And, uh, I mean, they're great dogs that do a great job retrieving. I do a lot of field hunting with my buddies. They use labs, and they're great. And I think mm -hmm. that's a place for them. I just don't, they can, again, I'm not no expert on the labs, and maybe it doesn't bother them. But when I see how cold it is, yeah. um, I always had labs, and there was an old carver here named Corb Reed, mm -hmm. Jay Corbin Reed. He was probably in his 80s. And he came, I mean, he was a good friend of mine. I, either I'd be at his house or he'd be at my house. He'd come shuffling in here. He was about 80 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> he pulled up and he walked in one day. I had an oil stove right here. And my, the last lab I had was asleep. I mean, she would, her hair would almost burst into flames. That's how close she got to that heater. <laughs> and he come walking in, the dog lifted his head up and looked at her, looked at him and uh, put his head back down. The old Corb stood there and he goes, Hey, boy. He goes, did your dog hunt? I thought, oh man, I'm going to be embarrassed now. I said, no, Mr. Reed. I said, uh, 
She doesn't like loud noises. She doesn't like the cold. And doesn't like water. <laughs> Bad combination for a hunting dog. He put his hand, he rubbed that chin. He went, eh, smart dog. <laughs> That's the answer I could hear. Cute, nice. Smart dog. And he came, sat in the rocking chair, and the dog never got up. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, maybe what I'm saying about labs isn't too far off because, yep. well, she loved it in here. I had a cow chair. She'd come in here and jump on that couch and she'd snore for eight hours a day. <laughs> they go to bed at night and sleep eight more. <laughs> nice life. Nice. Yep. Now, Corb was a good carver. Did you carve, carve oh, with him much? Or? Corb was something else. He was a character. Yeah, he was, uh, I carved with him and we better just leave it to that. <laughs> okay. He, he was a character. He was, he was something else. Yeah. <laughs> I sanded a lot of ducks for him. I had a drum sander. He didn't have a sander. He, he had a lot of secrets that he wouldn't pass on to anybody, including mm. me. But he was, uh, he wouldn't let you wash him paint. Mm. But he was, uh, he was something else. He taught me a lot about working decoys, about cork. He made a lot of cork birds. Mm. And how to seal them and the bottom board to use and down the heads. And I've shot over rigs of cork breed decoys. Uh, he was a great guy, mm. great guy. Now, is he the one that made the hollowed out goose Decoys no, for Tommy Reed. No, no. Ivor Hudson made them. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I think Ivor made them. I think Miles made some. But the old man Tom Reed's the one to have them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any outlaw gunning stories that you can share with us? On Stash camera. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps, Off put another way, area. are are there any stories that may or may not be yours? They may be other people's that you can share. Any, any <laughs> tricks or, or uh, stories that you've heard? Good God, I've been hunting all my life. Um, I mean, I went out with a guy, I was probably 18 or so, and during our hunting that one day, we came up on five duck traps. Now mm -hmm. this was just, this was probably 69 or 70. Mm -hmm. The, the shankatakers were still trapping ducks. Mm -hmm. Some people said, some people say, oh, there's no way they were trapping ducks that late, you know, in the 60s and 70s. There was still a load of duck trapping. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not going to say who was doing it, but I, mean, I, know, who, I know who it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was, uh, came up in five duck traps one day. I don't know how, I mean, every day he went off. The biggest thing, the biggest thing me and my brother Jim had was, was always using the excuse we ran out of gas uh, to get out of school. Mm. But I mean, we'd always had plenty, but it was always using the same excuse. Uh, the law was, the law was getting bad in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, been checked numerous times, only paid a few fines. Uh, don't do real good with game wardens unless <laughs> unless they're doing their job right. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a firm believer. If I've done something wrong, I'll pay the price. Mm -hmm. But don't get in my face and eyes and shove a gun at me and act like you know some FBI agent yeah. and there's no call for it. And too many of them like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had some bad experiences that way, and uh, it worked out all right. But I mean, nobody got shot. But uh, <laughs> you, you just don't have to act like that. I mean, yeah. people know the young, the, the, the carvers and the hunters, my age, they know who they were. They mm -hmm. know we know their names, and uh, I don't want to put it out to their families. They know who they were. Yeah. Uh, when I guided, uh, you take somebody out called a sport. When they book their hunt, they're a sport. And they call you up and they say, what do we need to hunt with? I said, well, you need a gun, mm -hmm. you need your boots, and what you're going to eat. I'll provide everything else. And these sports are right out of L.L. Bean catalog, most of them. <laughs> and they show up and they've got a gun. They don't know how to load it. They got their boots on, like what you got. Uh -huh. And I said, what do you got on your feet? And they go, that's my boots. You said, wear boots. <laughs> I said, son, we're not going deer hunting. With these little leather short boots. I said, we're going in the water, in the yeah. mud. They wouldn't even have boots, rubber boots. Take them out. I had a, uh, I took a party of three people out one day and I was on the point of marsh. Behind it was a, a gut with a lot of mud in it. I said, if you shoot something, don't go get it. I'll retrieve everything. Do not go get it. Well, they shot some birds, they flew over the point, flew, fell over the gut on the other side. I went to retrieve some other birds, came back. One of them was on the point of the marsh. And he's yelling, get my buddy, get my buddy. And I pulled the boat over, 
and he had tried to walk across that little gut. It was that much water and four feet of mud. Uh -huh. And he did just what I told him not. These guys are now, are, they're rocket scientists. They got master's degrees. Mm -hmm. They're city sports. They got more money than God. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to use it. So he walks across this gut, and gets halfway, and he's up to his waist. Mm -hmm. And he's screaming at me. I, by then I parked the boat and I walked up. I looked at him. And he's screaming at me to help him. I said, son, what do you want me to do? Yeah. He's like, quick, Sam. Yeah. You got to get me. You got. I said, didn't I tell you? Well, I started giving him hell for going in the mud. mud. He's sinking, and I'm yelling at him. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, I didn't get a tip that day either. <laughs> so uh, he said, he said, what are you going to do? I said, hold on. Just quit shaking and moving. I walked all over the marsh and found these old boards and poles and laid them out in the mud like a platform mm -hmm. and walked out, pulled them out of his boots. Then he wanted me to take him home to get washed up dry it out and buy new boots and go back out hunting again. <laughs> I refused because he wouldn't listen to me in the first yeah. place. Again, no tip that day. Another day I took three guys out. One of them had one arm. I don't know if he got shot off of Vietnam or what, but he had one arm. He had a 20 gauge over and under and he could break that gun down with his right hand, flip her down. And he, had a, he had a plastic, he didn't have a he had a hook, he had a hook here. Huh. So it was like a plastic piece. And he'd throw that, that 20 gauge over and break her down and huh. shoot the shells out, reach in his pocket, throw two more in and snap her up, lay her across his arm and could shoot like any wow. of them. I mean, he was something else. And just as fast as he could do it. I mean, he'd pop him, flip her, shoot the shells out, cross his arm, two more, hmm. and ready to go. So we hung all day long, and that afternoon, we're picking some decoys up. And what's he do? He I said, no, I'll get the decoys. You just sit there in the boat. Let me go. Because most of them, they break the heads off them. They want, they want to grab you their duck. They start wrapping the string around it, and they mm -hmm. drop it. And they break the head off them. So I said, leave my ducks alone. I'll do it. Well, he gets up and decides to help me, the guy with one arm. Yeah. So he gets up, and he slips head first. He goes overboard. Oh. Five foot of water. Four and a half, five foot. He falls overboard. He's hollering, bubbling. His two buddies are hollering. I'm trying to calm everybody down. His, he needs to get something with his arm to get a hold of. Yeah. Well, I've got a shoving pole in the boat. So his buddy grabs his shotgun and shoves it barrel first into his face. Now here's a guy with one arm, with one arm overboard in a cold winter holding a double barrel shotgun in his face. I don't know if it's loaded. He doesn't know if it's loaded. And they're pulling each other with oh a shotgun in his face. <laughs> I pushed the guy back, grabbed the gun. The guy with one arm sinks. It wasn't a real good day. <laughs> I guess not. Needless to say, I got the gun down, got the other guy away, and had to get the one armed man back in the boat. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a tip that day either. No. I do a lot of hollering when things don't go right. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, being a guide, hunting, um, I could tell you stories of killing 50 ducks a day, 75, 100. Mm. Some people wouldn't believe me. The game ones might. <laughs> so I'm not even going to tell you those kind of stories. And some people wouldn't believe them. The wrong people might believe them. Yeah. People on the island know I'm the duck man. Mm -hmm. They know I've killed a lot of ducks. Uh, there's three or four of us left. That's it. There ain't many left that, that, that hunted like we did from the late 60s on all through the 70s and 80s. Ah, my land, we killed some ducks. I mean, there are some people on here, and I'm not going to name, the, name their name. They know who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some good old boys. But uh, we, killed a, we killed a ton of ducks. Would I do it now? Because of the environmentalism and trying to help ducks out and all that? Yep, I sure would. If I could get away with it, I'd have to do it again. <laughs> Um, I, I'm honest too. I'll mm -hmm. tell you the truth. I've, I've always told the wife, she keeps saying when I come home, you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. You're going to jail. You're going to pay a big fine. I said, honey, I'll pay one big one. I'll pay one. But that's it. I won't pay two. That'll break me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the way and pretty much, uh, uh, you want a good old good story? And I'll just say his first name was Mel. Okay. I won't say no last name. 
this is a, a warden or a, somebody? Uh, it could be. It could be a warden. Okay. Or ex warden. Not, yeah. <laughs> Years ago, old Big Mel. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. He, uh, my son was out hunting and he come in. I won't say it was at night time. It was late in the afternoon. And he come in. He's about 12, 13 years old. And he came in with the, in the boat. He had two buddies with him. Two of my good buddies. And uh, Big Mel pulled him over. He said, uh, I'm going to rate you up for shooting after dark. Attempting to hunt after hours. So he started writing the citations. And he looked in this on the floor, he had a trash bag, and he said, uh, Ryan, he said, what he, what's in that, looks like a load of beer cans in that, in that bag. He goes, yes, sir, I cleaned the blind out. I don't know who's been hunting my blind, and my son hadn't been drinking. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was way too young for that. Um, so he said, I cleaned the blind out when I came, when I came out. I don't know who's been gunning it, but they're not ours. I just cleaned the trash out. So Mel writes him all these, all these uh, fines for what he did, what he didn't do. He comes into the Red Eye, the hunting club we, we own, and uh, my son tells me what happened. So I come home. I was very smart, upset the next day, and called him up. I said, "What's going on, Big Mel?" And he told me how he was attempting to hunt after hours. Mm -hmm. I said, "When well, you checked him, was his gun in the case or out of the case?" He said, "It was in the case." I said, "Was it loaded or unloaded?" Unloaded. I said, well, how the hell do you, I said, did you see him shoot? No. I said, well, how the hell do you, do you figure he was attempting to shoot after hours? Well, he was in the blind at 6 o'clock that night. I said, yeah, we do that all the time. We observe where the birds are going that evening yeah. for it to be ready the next day. A lot of times. It was a pretty night. I said, uh, Mel, I can go out there at midnight tonight, spend the night in that blind. If my gun's not loaded, you can't do a thing to me. Mm -hmm. Not nothing. I said, no, I'm going to tell you something right now, buddy. My lawyer is going to see your lawyer in court, and you're going to feel like a fool when I'm done with your ass. Mm -hmm. That's just what I told him. He said, well, let me see what I can do about this. I said, you do what you want. I said, we'll see you in court. Mm -hmm. Well, he called me back an hour later. He said, I want you to know that all charges have been dropped. Nice. I said, I thought you'd see it my way. Mm -hmm. I went right to the Salisbury Mall about a week later, and there was this guy making up bumper stickers in the mall. For ten dollars, he'd make anything he wanted. Print it out just like that. I told the wife, I said, I've got to take care of something. She said, What are you gonna do? I said, Watch this. I told that man, I said, I want you to make me a bumper sticker that big. He said, What do you want on it? I said, Would you put Mel sucks? <laughs> he said, What? I said, just do what I tell you, son. I'll give you the money, put Mel sucks. He said, okay, gets it done. The wife said, What are you gonna do with that? Don't worry about that. I come right home. I had eighteen foot shank take scow and 115 mercury. Center console. Mm -hmm. Feels her bat. And that console. Mel sucks. It stayed there five solid years. <laughs> the next game warden that checked me looked at that and after he was he didn't write no fine that day, but he checked me and he looked at my console. He said, Well, don't tell me, is that who I think that is? I said, I didn't say nothing. You just make your own mind up. He said, You're riding around with that on your console in front of a federal, federal game warden. Mm -hmm. I said, you better believe it. Well, that went on, it stayed there, and I mean it was the best bumper sticker this guy could ever make in the world. It wouldn't peel off or nothing, didn't fade. I was up with a red eye one day, and an old cigar was come up in his boat, him and New Merrick. And they walked down the dock, and he stopped, and he went back. He said, hey, boy, he said, come here. He said, uh, that sticker you got on your boat, Mel sucks. He said, is that? And he said his name. I said, you better believe it. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what happened. He said, son, I'm going to tell you something right now. You're either the bravest man in the world or the dumbest <laughs> son of a bitch that ever lived. And he walked away. We were using that same boat for the pony roundups when the federal game board was over there. Mm -hmm. And my son went and drive my boat <laughs> to, to <laughs> put a jacket over the console because yeah. he was scared he was going to get rode up. Sure. And when I sold that boat, it still had that sticker on it. Nice. But yeah, I've had a lot of, I've had some good little, I've had some good time with the game wardens. Those are some, some good stories. Is there anything else that we're missing that, that you want us to add? A ton of stuff. I could yeah. write a book. Yeah, well, we should come, we'll have to come back for a follow-up. Yeah, and I'm on the island. So. But um, yeah, anything else for today? Um, 
Yeah, one more thing. I want to wish you a happy birthday to Captain Cigar Daisy. He was 87 years old yesterday. Uh, he's been an integral part of the decoy world. Uh, there was an article written on him a couple of years ago in Decoy Magazine, and it was entitled Man of a Few Words. And evidently, the guy that wrote that never knew Cigar Daisy. <laughs> If you could go back to your, some of your predecessors in the Ward Foundation mm -hmm. and ask them to tell you some stories about old Captain Say. Yep. And he was not of a few words. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could write a book on him. Yeah. But, but happy birthday to him and uh, thank him for, for helping me, for steering me and guiding me. I attribute everything in my decoy business, number one, to my wife for sticking with me and uh, Doug Jester. Bobby Elflett and Cigar mm -hmm. Daisy. Yep, they were the ones who got me started and kept me going and, and uh, taught me enough so that now I can teach somebody else. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you for doing an interview with us. Yeah, thank you. Hope so it wasn't too long. It'll give you a no. month to than that down. No, that was good. When I was, uh, when I do these chopping demonstrations for the Ward Foundation mm -hmm. in, in April, and the one in October, mm -hmm. I found out that it's a whole lot better to bring cottonwood. Cedar, you got to be real careful. When you get down to the bottom, and you start chopping on cedar. Does it chip away or, or it'll start split, to break? It'll yeah. split right here. It just yeah. wants to explode on you. You've got. I found myself at the Ward Foundation. I'd give her a little bit of this real easy. I have to go back this way yeah. because when you make a mistake, you got to show people that you didn't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'd be chopping along at the, at the ward show, and I hit here, bam, half the yeah. tail flies off. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I meant to do that. Yeah. You know, I just keep right on going. I spin around the other way, bam, half the tail flies off. <laughs> it's embarrassing as hell. I mean, but you can't. Yeah. That wood, this wood is really dry. Chopping downward on the tail, you're good to go. No problem. You know there's a whole bunch of novice carvers out there being, well this is what Rotary did. Yeah. <laughs> They're making all these broke tails so gotta, that are trying to look I like I do this little pre-cut on the bottom to stop to stop the yep. break. And this is very this is very dangerous what I'm doing now. I never do this here. I never do it. So Don't do I had to learn that show. I had to make a pre-cut to stop the splitting. Barely hit it, but it looks like fine detail when I'm doing it for the public. So that's where the head's going to fit in. Mm -hmm. Gotta be real careful doing this with a head. I don't cheat. I don't teach anybody chopping. It's just knowing the grain, knowing the wood, yeah. knowing how much you can take off. That's about as much That's as I great. do with That's a hatchet. Fun. So, do you use a draw knife also, or does the hatchet replace the draw knife for you? you use a draw knife. Okay. Right here. The next step I do. I only built this about, about three years ago. Two three years ago. A little spacer in there. That's the idea. I used to hold these between my knees. <laughs> God. Which angle do you think I should get at? This one? He's going to pull toward himself on there. That's my favorite part. I, I don't carve a lot, but what I do, that's my favorite. There's something satisfying about that. I don't use a spoke shave, I like to draw a knife. Mm -hmm.
Did you hunt with redheads in your rig, or is it? Yep, there's a okay. rig up over there. Yeah. You don't see a lot of redheads around here. Well, want some water? I got a whole refrigerator full of it. Oh, thank you, though. A beer? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you on that another time. Whiskey? <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> when we come back for the second interview. Alrighty. We'll have some that sounds good. Plan on that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we'll bring some. There you go. <laughs> what kind of whiskey do you drink? Or beer? <laughs> I like Coronas. Nice. Or the Sakis. Okay. The most interesting man. <laughs> the world's the, most those interesting Suckies man. Those like the most. Have you ever seen those commercials? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So you're the only one we know who can talk at the same time as doing this. <laughs> Bottom tools is a 99% uh, sanding. Ah, uh, okay. Sanding uh, disc and sleeves on them. Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, hand carve and hand hand do uh, every body, every head. Uh, I don't make the heads or bodies with a grinding tool. So when you go to sand around that bill or sand yeah. the eye holes uh, around behind the neck, you make them with a with a fording tool. And again, that's where a lot of the people, the kids nowadays, are starting off. Yeah. I didn't have a fording tool for for 20 years, <laughs> at least. You know, that's a great thing what you're doing because what's becoming extinct in America is old people. Mm. When you think about it, when they're gone, they take all the history with them. There's so much stuff that's not written down.